today the title of my message is going to be uh, Living Courageously or Live uh, Courageously. Um, I just want to touch on some of these objects for our prayer and fasting time. God bless those of you that have joined in in fasting. And we're, we're doing this from last Monday right on through. At some level, I encourage you to participate. I know that there are some that are going all the way through with juices and, and uh, uh, soups and that type of thing. Um, somebody told me, so when I fast, anything I can get through a straw, you know. I, uh, <laughs> but I found out you can purate uh, ground beef, you know, too. And, <laughs> but I don't recommend that. There's absolutely no legalism attached to fasting. Anything that we do nowadays is really a sacrifice. But understand this, that it's not something that we do to twist God's arm, try to get God to do something that he has never done or, won't, or has it been, hasn't been willing to do. God does not dangle the carrot in front of us in hopes that we'll just keep on struggling and striving. That's not what it's all about. But it's really positioning ourselves so we can hear from him. Let me give you the seven points real quickly. I share these on Sunday morning so that it helps us to understand where it, number one, Declaring our independence on God in every area of our lives. I've already touched on that just a moment ago. If, if we can do it without God, then we really don't need him. But we need him. This is his kingdom. Uh, number two, asking God for wisdom and resources to do his will. Number three, praying for people to come to Jesus. Uh, really having a heart to see new people come to him. Number four, believing for breakthroughs and areas of challenge. Some of us face areas right now of challenge in our lives and we really do need the hand of God uh, you know and we need God to do it we because we've tried everything else maybe but or there's no other way but for God to do it and believe me he can and he will number five trusting God for the completion of the new building number six inviting the presence of God into our church and our lives I, I just think that this is so important just want people when they come into our presence whether it be in this building or in the marketplace or in workplace or whatever that the presence of God will be in our lives in such a way that people are touched don't be surprised during this time when you're seeking the Lord when you're drawing near to him uh, if your life doesn't become a magnet you'll notice people staring at you and uh, you'll notice people just uh, when you walk into a place there's something different about that person and maybe God will open a door for you to witness to them. And number seven, prevailing in prayer for revival for our generation. Well, I want to talk to you this morning about living courageously. Now I want to go to Joshua, the third chapter. We're in these first few chapters of Joshua. And I'm just absorbing these first few ch chapters <clears throat> because I think that they're so apropos for each and every one of us. And I ask you today just to take the words that, that we share today and, and just translate them into your situation, into your, uh, into your life, into your present condition, whatever you may be facing. And, uh, but I, I just want to say that you know, not, none of this is taken from a text or a book somewhere except from the Bible and also just some things that I just sense that God wants to speak to us and that he has spoken to me, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. Joshua, the third chapter, the sixth verse. This is the word to Joshua from the Lord. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. He repeats it. Be careful to obey all of my law that my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep the law of uh, the book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. And uh, I looked up those words prosperous and successful and I have some meanings of those words from the Hebrew and the Greek and they mean prosperous and successful. Okay. <laughs> Number nine. <laughs> so... Just take it, and whatever God says from that, say it. Say, well, no, I don't believe in all that prosperity stuff. Well, okay, that's all right. Well, we're, we're just, just give, give it to me. You know, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be happy to get it. Number nine, have I not commanded you? So it's a command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For 
the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Now, this is to Joshua. And um, I, I went back, though, to the latter part of Deuteronomy because I thought there were some things that, there, that we needed to see here. Because God speaks to him in Deuteronomy, or, or at least the, the writer of, of the law, uh, which we consider to be Moses, uh, pens these words regarding God's command. And look at Deuteronomy 31, verse 3. It's in the same setting. After God has told Moses, you're not going to go with them. You're, gonna, you're going to lay down your head. You're going to die. And you're going to come to be with me in heaven. But then the children of Israel will go over. And he says in, in uh, Deuteronomy 31, 3, the Lord your God himself crosses over before you. Isn't that good to know that Wherever you're going, God's already been. And he will destroy these nations before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. This is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. So he says in verse 6, and then just going down a little bit, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the God who goes before you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel. This is affirmation. This is affirmation. Not just in private, but before all the people. Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with this people to the land which the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he is the one. Everybody say, and the Lord, and say, he is the one who goes before you. See, that's, that's, that's encouraging to me. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. I just have four things that I want to give you today that I drew out of these passages as I have been reading this and the rest of Joshua. Number one is this, that it, the command, it's a command. To be strong is really a command. He, he says it several times, be, you know, be strong. So it sounds like a command, not a suggestion. Have you ever noticed that they're called the ten what? Not the ten good ideas, but they're the ten commandments. And so the meanings are pretty straightforward. Be strong. That means to be firm, unflinching, to rise up, be strong, and courageous. That means to be brave, means to be bold against adversity. Now, if God tells us to do something, then what we do is we do it out of obedience. We do, we do it not because we feel like it. You know, we don't do it just because... Oh, man, I just don't feel like that. I remember one time, uh, Chloe was about three years old, and her mother told her to do something. And she said, I am not in the spirit. Isn't that what she said? I'm not in the spirit. And she said, what spirit are you talking about? She said, the spirit of the living God. At three years old. She said, I'll get you in the spirit real quick. And, and, and she did. Of course, I'm in the other room. I am laughing. Because I'm thinking, thank God, it all comes home to roost. Yes, it does. Uh, spirit. So, uh, Catholics will say it's not of tradition. You know, I don't do that because we, it's not of our tradition. The evangelicals will say, well, I can't find that in the Word. But we charismatics, we and, and, and those from that background, you know, uh, um, will say, well, I just don't feel. I got to feel like doing it. How many of you know that if you go through life, you're going to, you're going to do some things that you don't feel like doing. Amen? Amen? I mean, I don't feel like emptying the dishwasher. I hate it. I don't mind loading one. It's just emptying it. I have. I've done it three times, and I know that you can do it if you, if you, if you really set your heart to do it. I just don't feel like doing it. I mean, Delia will tell you, I will take a, a bunch of dishes and wash them right in the sink so I don't have to go through the, the process. He says, why are you doing that? I said, well, Grandma said there wasn't that cancer going on until all these dishwashers came along, you know, so I'm just washing the dishes out. I did say that in jest to somebody one time. They didn't like it because they happened to ascribe to that idea as well. But there's some things that we do that we don't uh, feel like doing. 
don't allow God's commands, his do commands, to, uh, to be overwhelmed by, or, or to uh, don't allow your emotions to trump God's commands, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Our feelings, our inner resistance, excuses have nothing to do with it. We cannot give allegiance to our emotions. And the reason why that God gives these commands to them is he knows that they're going to be in situations that absolutely terrify them. So it's not, oh, Lord, help me in those situations. It's, Lord, because you have said it, I am going to be strong. I'm just going to be strong. The difference between victory and defeat is whether you say, I will be strong and I will remain strong. Number two, there's no progress without change, and there's no change without discomfort. So God is charging Joshua and all of Israel to go forward. I want to show you, he says, where your future is. You have a purpose, and that purpose is not to wander in the wilderness the rest of your life, but it's to go to another step. And here they've been in the wilderness, and what has happened to them in the wilderness? God has led them by the cloud by daytime, pillar of fire by nighttime, and every morning they didn't have to work for anything. Manna fell out of heaven and fed them. Now they got tired of that manna, for sure. After 40 years, you'd get tired of it. And uh, kind of like I'm getting tired of tomato juice. You know, <laughs> it'll get, you'll get tired of it after a while. But still, it was provision. It was there. They were grateful for it. They probably fried it. They made cakes out of it. They sauteed it. They made uh, uh, manna shakes out of it. All kinds of stuff. So manna, manna, manna. We don't really know what that manna was, but it was manna. And manna means what is it? And so they ate what is it for 40 years. The Bible says that when they went across Jordan, guess what? That very first day, what happened? The manna stopped. And he said, now I'm going to give you houses you didn't dwell in. I'm going to give you vineyards that you did not plant. It's a different thing now. You're not going to just be depending upon somebody, a handoff here. But you're going to now do some work. And it's going to be different. And you know, when we go from one place to the other, you cannot make progress unless you change something. Can't do, keep on doing the same thing over and over again and expect to get new results. You, you, you understand that in order for you to go forward, in order for you to progress, to advance, there's going to be some change. And along with that change, there will be some discomfort. And if you're in fasting right now, I, I know that you understand this. There is discomfort that is involved in fasting and prayer like this. But there's change taking place too. So when I'm doing the same thing, I stay in my comfort zone. But you listen, I only have one life to live. Why not live risky? You know, some people say, somewhere over the rainbow. I can't remember the rest of that, but I think that there's a place of rest and relaxation. But it doesn't work that way. See, sometimes we, we go through life saying, I just want to get to that place. I just want, I just that place where I can, I can rest a little bit. And you know what? God may give you a, a mesa of fulfillment for a while, but there's also another mountain on top on the other side of the mesa, and God's going to take you to something bigger and better and greater. He really is. And so life is not getting to an easy place. Life is when it gets too easy, you begin to ask God for the challenge. You go to a harder place. And since your destiny is defined by God, there is still something that he has for you to do. And guess what? When you get into that place, that's where the peace and joy comes. That's risky living. And it's not like I just decide to do something and ask God to bless my agenda. But when he calls, when God says, come on, when God says, get out of the boat and come to me, when God says it's time for you to take another step, y'all know what I'm talking about because he does it to every one of us. When he does that, I must be a faithful to that assignment. I'm not called to be faithful to an assignment to which I've not been called, but an, an assignment that has been given to me, I'm to be faithful to that assignment. God is not looking for ambition. God is looking for obedience. Amen. He doesn't want you to be ambitious about it. He just wants you to be obedient. Believe me, when God calls, it's usually an ambitious task 
and just be obedient to it. Go. Can you drive out those enemies? No. Can you make the walls of Jericho fall? No. Can you do any of that stuff? No. But you can be obedient to him. And if you're obedient to him, and you are willing to move forward, you're going to see the results. Remember when Peter was, when, when Jesus was walking on the water, the disciples are in that boat on the Sea of Galilee, and there's a terrible storm, and they look up, which is really funny because they look up and they see Jesus coming, and first of all, they're afraid of the storm, and now they're afraid, they say, it's a ghost. They're afraid of who's coming. And then they realize it's Jesus. And Jesus says to Peter, Peter, why don't you get out of the boat? And I, sometimes I think that's what the Lord is saying to us, get out of the boat and walk on the water. And though the boat is swaying, though it's rocking and it's rolling and it's filling up with water, still there's just something under your feet, you know? It's kind of like when I used to go with the kids to these uh, to Six Flags and such of that, way back yonder when I would ride all of those rides. In fact, last year, Delia and I took our, some of our grandkids and we rode every ride that they rode. And um, I, I was wide as a sheet several times. In the, but you know what? I never liked one where there's not something under my feet. I don't care how high the roller coaster has. I just like to have something under my feet. But those dangling rides, I just don't like my feet dangling. And spiritually, I don't like my feet dangling. I like to be on solid, solid ground. You know, I like security. And I, I like, oh, here's a place of rest. There is a place of a sacred rest near to the heart of God. Just keep me right here, Lord. This is wonderful. This is like a nest. Oh, I feel fulfilled. And I, oh, the, oh, this is, I'm breathing peace for a change. And this is wonderful. And then, boom, then things start to move. And God's moving my boat. And, uh, and, and I'm rebuking the devil because Jesus did that, you know, and the, and the wind stops. So I'm rebuking the devil. I, you get out of here. You get, and nothing happens. And then the Lord says, I happen to be the one rocking the boat a little bit. Because I want you to step out of the boat, and I want you to take a, a, a step toward your future, what I have for you next. And I would rather, I would rather have some security under me than to take the chance. And some of us say, well, I do this, this, and this, and this, and that's it. Anything else, I don't do it. And it may be that God is going to call you to do something in 2015 that you have never done before. Well, I'm not going to teach those kids. I've done my teaching. I have taught. I have taught. I've taught 17 generations. I have taught. It may be that the Lord calls you to teach some more kids again about Jesus. Well, I've, I've done this, I've done that, but God may. I, I've reached out. I've given to the poor. Well, maybe God is going to call you to reach out and give to the poor once again. Or maybe he's going to call you. Well, I've always felt like that my ministry was right here, and God's going to say, well, your ministry is going to be. Well, I've always felt like that my calling, my gifting, and everything is, should be invested in this kind of employment, and then uh, your world begins to shake and, God's, and you find yourself looking for new employment, but it's in another area, in another realm. Don't be afraid. That's why he says, keeps on saying, don't be afraid. Number three, courage will carry you through when life seems so fragile and uncertain. I, you know, when you begin to pray, uh, Especially, uh, this is uh, something I experience. When I'm fasting and praying, I, I become sensitive to the needs of others. I, be, I found myself able to identify many times with the pain of other people and sense uh, a need of intercession for them. There are times when your life, and there's somebody sitting here today undoubtedly, where you feel like that your life is fragile and your future is uncertain. Like one more straw is going to cause a breakdown. I cannot handle any more. Now, may I validate your feeling? Because I have been there too. It isn't because you haven't had faith. It isn't because of something wrong with you spiritually. It isn't because God has turned his back on you. It isn't because, uh, because necessarily of something you have done but this is a time for you to be strong 
and to have courage. To stand boldly, to stand firmly in the midst of this battle, battle that you are facing. And the walk of obedience is sometimes a lonely walk. I know that we have one another, but there are times when you will be in a crowd and still be lonely. Don't feel like that those times are a loss. God is doing something in the midst of your loneliness. He is the one who takes loneliness and turns it into aloneness with him. And what you are going through is something that will bring you out on the other side powerfully and, and gloriously. And other people can encourage you. They, they may be sympathetic with you. They may be empathetic with you. There's a new word in philosophy. They're, they may be interpathetic. Interpathetic? Which, just look it up. It's, it's a, or they must, may just be pathetic. But there is a lonesome valley that you must walk alone. No one can walk it for you. Personal decisions that are made, personal victories that have to be experienced, personal advances that have to be accomplished. And I might say, well, I'm not supernatural, but you are not just natural either. You have the power of God residing within you. And you have the ability to stand up and first of all, say to yourself, then say to the devil, and then confess to the Lord, Lord, I am going to be strong, and I am going to be courageous. I'm going to have courage in the midst of this. You remember when Jacob of old, the Bible says that he wrestled with the angel of the Lord all night long. He wrestled with God because he was facing one of the most difficult responsibilities and tasks that were before him. What a, what a terrible, terrible thing that he was facing. What an incredible thing that he was facing. And th no doubt when he wrestled with the Lord, the Bible says that he took his family or he took his family, put them on one side of the river, and he went to the other side of the river. And there he was alone with God, and he was there wrestling with him, wrestling with all the, the stuff that he had to do. Tomorrow was showing up. As a matter of fact, his brother Esau was coming, and Esau had it in for him, and it was one of the most challenging days of his life that he was going to meet his brother. But all alone, he wrestled with God. He could have said, well, I, where's my community, and where are others? And, and, uh, but let me just say to you, what makes you strong in community in tomorrow's valley, what makes you strong is what takes place when you are alone with God. Somebody who touched my life when I was a young minister was an African-American evangelist by the name of Willie Johnson. And Willie Johnson used to sing this song, Shut in with God in a secret place, there in the Spirit, beholding His face, gaining new power to run in the race alone to be shut in with God. And I never I could say, sit and listen to her sing it for hours. And there's just something about being alone with him that's going to give you power when you get in community. When you get around others, you're going to have power because you've spent time alone with God. I encourage you, these 21 days, get alone with God. Spend some time with him. See, this is why the Lord says, that, that, this is why he says to the people, the Lord has gone before you. And then he says, furthermore, Joshua has gone before you. This is, this is Moses speaking to the people and encouraging them. Not only has God been where you are going, but others have gone before and set the example. And you'll notice something amazing about these others too is that nobody that God ever called, no one ever felt qualified. Have you ever noticed that? Yeah. No one. No one said, okay, I, I, I'm qualified. Even when Isaiah said, here I am, Lord, send me, he did not say, I'm qualified to do this. And I have come to believe that it is your disqualification that qualifies you to be the servant of God, to do what you need to do. Your inadequacies and your weaknesses, those are the things that qualify you to be what God has called you to be.
So God is one who delights in your disqualifications because he qualifies. He's the one who qualifies you. Amen. God is the one who qualifies you. God is for the underdogs. He loves underdogs. The underdog has the advantage because he puts his trust in God. Something else that came to me is this week was that God hears the cries of his people. Don't think for one moment that God is not hearing your prayers. When you cry out to him, when you call out to him, God is hearing you. The Bible says in the history of, in the history of God's people that at specific moments when they were at a, uh, a turning point in their experience with God, that they cried out to him. They cried out to him and they heard him. In the fourth chapter of Genesis, it says that people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Abraham dedicated the altar, called upon the name of the Lord. Isaac, Jacob, they called upon the name of the Lord. David said, the Lord heard me when I cried to him. But let me just say this. God does not hear the cries that are not cried. He hears the cries that are cried. It does not say that he hears the good intentions of his people. He does not hear the good ideas that we may have. He does not hear heartfelt motives. Find yourself a place where you can cry out to God. Even if it's coming by here during the week, coming into the sanctuary where no one is here, and just voice your opinions and your praises and your love and your devotion and your intercession and your petition and your prevailing, just Give it to him. Something else that uh, spoke to me about was the prayer of faith. The Bible says the prayer of faith will save the sick. And I was just thinking of that while I was in prayer here this week. The prayer of faith. It's called the prayer of faith because that's what it is. It's not just a prayer. It's the prayer of faith. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're never going to be heard of God because you're, it's just repetition. You're just saying prayers. So at nighttime, we don't say our prayers, we pray. When we get up in the morning, we don't just say our prayers because it's kind of a, a thing that you do and by some kind of a, a rote thing on, on our part, we just, we just, we just, oh, I'm saying my prayers today. No, we pray. And it's called the prayer of faith. That means the kind of prayer where we believe what we're praying is going to happen. We believe that, uh, that when we call upon God, he's going to hear us. I'm praying this week for things to happen this year, but I'm praying in faith, God. I'm praying that you're going to do it. I don't want a powerless God. I'm not serving a powerless God. I don't want to be a powerless person. I don't want to be powerless people. I want us to have his power. And then fourth, let me just give this to you real quick. You've got to be bigger than rather than consumed by your environment. You've got to be bigger than that. We're either victims or we're perpetrators. And he says, be strong, because you're going to go out there and you're going to do things. Be strong. You are a, a perpetrator. Let me give to you a passage of Scripture, just in closing. Ephesians, the 6th chapter, the 10th verse. The Apostle Paul says, here's the final word. Be strong. Everybody say, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on all of the armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, be strong. This battle is not against flesh and blood. This battle is not against people. This battle is against forces that we cannot even see. And even when we see the immediate or the temporal thing taking place, that's not where the battle is. The battle is beyond that. And if ever in the world, and if ever in America, and if ever in our communities, ever in this city, ever in this nation, we needed to rise up and be strong in the Lord and the power of his might is right now. And I just want to drop that word with you today. I ask you to take these thoughts 
and just kind of assimilate those in your mind and invest those into your everyday activity, into wherever you are with God and with life right now, and just let it unfold. But the main thing is this. Don't give up. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. Be strong and be very courageous. Because one thing God says, that if you will do that, he will see you through. And someone here today may be on the precipice of the greatest, greatest breakthrough you have ever experienced. But at the same time, you're fighting the greatest battle that you have ever fought. And I'm just here to tell you, that though no one else may know about the battle that you are facing, God knows that battle, and he's on your side, and he's going to bring you through. Amen? Let's bow our hearts in prayer.